Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Sivia Schwartz Getzig. I'm the director of JFN West. And I wanted to welcome you to our inaugural JFN West regional gathering called When the Smoke Clears. When we envisioned this conference, our Western states were on fire, complicating a year already struck by a pandemic, the glaring realities of racial and economic injustice, and a very contentious election. Today, nine months since the beginning of the pandemic, we come together to aggregate our thinking about the needs of our Jewish community and our vision for the future. This past Shabbat, my rabbi was quoting the late Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, who said we should consider Shabbat a day to make space for the important but not urgent things in our lives. That Covey Square that many of us find a hard time to make, have a hard time making time for. But today is not Shabbat. And indeed, today is the day when we're here to consider what is important and urgent. Over the last few years, we focused our work in the West on building a community of funders and providing programming in support of your interests and needs. And this inaugural regional conference is the result of your desire to weave a more cohesive regional network and to offer programs that meet those interests. As with so many things that begin in the West, what we've created here today will serve as a pilot to be replicated in other regions for other JFN members. We invite you to continue to share your interests, which will guide our future programming. Speaking of guidance, I want to express my deep appreciation for the creativity and dedication provided by our planning committee, our host committee, and our sponsors. You can see the full list of our committees by clicking the button that says WTSC Leadership on your screen. And please help me thank the JFN staff, my colleagues, for their dedication passion and commitment to you and to Jewish philanthropy. And in particular, David Ezer, our Vice President of Program, and Deborah Feldstein, our Associate Director in JF at JFN West, thank you. I'm sure you've noticed that we're trying this new platform, fingers crossed and toes crossed that it all works seamlessly. But if you have any technical issues, Feel free to private chat anyone with the name lunch pool next to their name or a JFN staff person who will have the words JFN next to their name or pop over to the help desk located at the bottom right of the first floor of your screen. So okay, with eyes open to blue skies that lie ahead and hearts and minds focused on the important and urgent work ahead. It's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, JFN CEO, Andres Spicoini, who will frame the day for us. Enjoy. It's a great pleasure to be here and um, with all of you uh, virtually. I, I, I think that hearing you speak about the fires and the election and uh, the year that we just have, I'm thinking of the Parsha that we read uh, this week, which is the the fight of uh, Jacob with, with the angel. And it says that it fights through a very long night and he doesn't see his opponent, right? And it's kind of what we have. We're fighting through a long night with an opponent we can't see for the virus and with, and in that long night, we sometimes can't see each other very well either. So I think um, this is an opportunity of trying to see each other and try to, strengthen the relationship with uh, each other. Um, you, you know, it, this is an opportunity. I think that, that one of the things that the pandemic offers as a, as a silver lining of sorts is, is rediscover the, the importance of relationships. You know, Judaism is, is, a, is a culture of relationships and nobody better than you know, Martin Buber talked about us, the, the dialogue, the, the, the philosophy of dialogue, as he called it, the philosophy of relationship in which we need to try to build relations that are not necessarily instrumental, but are necessary for our own selves, not just about what we can do for each other, but how we can connect at a very deep level with one another. And this is what this day is about, is about creating relations, is about connecting with issues and with each other and trying to imagine what happens 
as Sylvia said, when the smoke cleared, when this this long night in which we're wrestling against unseen enemies um, uh, finally finishes and daylight breaks, um, we will need to build together. We will need to work together. And for that, we will need to try and be uh, as good as we can in terms of of our relationships. So I hope that during this day, we will have um, a time to, to experience these, these relationships, to dig deeper into the issues and to uh, try to think about a new community system emerging out of this long year. So we, I'm going to give the floor to Sintra, who is going to introduce the plenary and, um, and the speakers that are going to be there. Welcome, everyone, to the opening plenary for When the Smoke Clears. Uh, when we named this conference, as Cynthia mentioned, we were looking at this layer cake of awful. Um, we had a global airborne pandemic. We were facing the dire economic consequences of the health crisis. And we were in the middle of a political fractious climate. Uh, to top it off, all of us in the West were watching our skies turn apocalyptic while wildfires consumed our forests and towns. Wow, at least some of the fires have subsided. Um, so take a deep breath. As Andre shared a moment ago, this is an opportunity for us as a community of Jewish funders to take a moment to reflect on the impact of all of this on our Jewish institutions and the community. And most importantly, to get involved and take action now to support a vision for the Jewish community of the future. Our first session this morning will feature a presentation from Dr. Una Osili, Ephraimson Chair in Philanthropy at the Lilly School of Philanthropy at Indiana University. Dr. Osili will offer a high-level view on how philanthropy in general has been impacted in the last nine months. Following Dr. Osili, Andres will lead a conversation with Dr. Osili, Rachel Levin, President of Fundamental Inc. and Executive Director of the Righteous Persons Foundation and Alexandra Shabtai, advisory board member of her family's foundation, Glazer Philanthropies, and also a board member at the Jewish Federations of Greater Los Angeles, the Jewish Community Foundation Los Angeles, and At The Well. The panel will discuss what they saw, what they learned, and where they will focus as they begin to think about supporting the Jewish community and its institutions moving forward. Please welcome Dr. Una Osli. Today, I'd like to share the work that has been going on here at the Lilly Family School. Unlike in other pandemics, we have access to a treasure trove of data on how the philanthropic sector is changing and what it means for all of us. A few years ago, our team coined this phrase called philanthrometrics. It takes an age old concept, something that is a core Jewish value, philanthropy. Uh, it means love of mankind. The word itself dates back to the ancient Greeks and Romans and merges it with a much newer word, metrics. The word metrics doesn't show up in the English language until the 1800s. When you put these two concepts together, you have a powerful way uh, forward in that uh, although there is great uncertainty around us, we do have data uh, from all different sources to help us understand what's happening now and what it means for the future. So with that, philanthropometrics is our word for today. The very first finding as we look at the data is that the donor landscape itself is changing. Before the pandemic, we were able to uh, work on Giving USA and launch Giving USA 2020 for the very first time in a virtual format. From the Giving USA 2020 report, we know that giving climbed to an all time high of $450 billion. And although individuals made up the majority of the donations in the United States, that 69% uh, that comes from individuals is actually the lowest we've observed since we started tracking giving dating back to the 1950s. Foundations made up their largest slice at 17% 
of giving. And corporate giving, while uh, quite uh, steady over time, has remained at 5% of overall giving. Uh, what I'd like to point out, however, is that if you add up individuals, half of family foundations and charitable bequests, you would still have 88 or 89% of giving from individuals, emphasizing the power of individuals, even in these uncertain times, to change the world. Secondly, when we look at where giving is going, we should note that religious congregations still receive the lion's share of American philanthropy. It's religious congregations are still the largest destination and recipient of charitable dollars, but that share, that 29%, is also the lowest we've observed. If we look back at Giving USA in the 1950s and 60s, religious congregations actually gained about two thirds of American philanthropy. In addition, we've seen uh, the environment and international affairs emerge as uh, some of the fastest growing areas in philanthropy. Uh, you might uh, ask, where does uh, the Jewish uh, federations, Jewish um, groups, where do most of them fit? We know that some of them fit under the public society benefits subsector, which uh, accounts for about 8% of American philanthropy. But we also see Jewish organizations, Jewish serving organizations in many other sectors, including education and human services and many other sectors, healthcare being one of them. The second finding, in addition to emphasizing that the donor landscape is changing, is looking at the large scale donors. Uh, over time, as we have uh, studied million dollar plus donors over time, we've noted the growing number of couples, the power of joint giving, the power couples in philanthropy. We've also noted the growing role of women with more women uh, making million dollar plus gifts. Some of the most prominent uh, recent gifts include uh, Joan Crock's bequest, uh, which uh, the Salvation Army was a primary beneficiary, but also gifts from uh, many other donors, including Sarah Blakely, founder of Spanx, um, uh, the Melinda Gates uh, Maverick Collective, even groups like Women Moving Millions that are showcasing the power of women, uh, female donors. Uh, we're also uh, still able to observe, even in this time, that some people prefer to give anonymously, and 4 to 5% of million-dollar gifts are still made anonymously, uh, even in this period of a great deal more transparency in charitable giving. Finally, I just wanted to note that many uh, in the past, we saw that most large donors were over the age of 50, but in this time period, we've seen many more donors under the age of 50 joining the ranks of million dollar donors, including one of the largest gifts made during the pandemic was by Jack Dorsey, founder of Twitter, who gave a um, billion dollars in Twitter stock. And uh, some of that giving is being tracked on the West Coast. You can see the spreadsheet and who is receiving those gifts. It turns out his very large gift accounts for about a quarter of his net worth. The next finding in terms of how philanthropy is changing, I just want to note that while we have seen unprecedented generosity during the pandemic, the average rate of giving in the U.S., the fraction of Americans who give, has been falling over time. In fact, prior at the beginning of the 21st century, two-thirds of Americans gave. That number is now down to 55%. We used to say that more Americans gave than any other civic activity. Well, with this election and the very high fraction of voting that we observed, that may not be true anymore with overall giving rates at 55%. So a call to action to all of you in the audience today is what can we all do to strengthen this tradition within the Jewish community, certainly, but even beyond that, to continue to increase this overall rate of giving. Uh, having said that, among those who do give, the average amount has held steady or increased over time at about $2,500. The next key finding is the role of diverse donors in transforming philanthropy. I mentioned the rising role of female donors. I also wanted to note, in addition to younger donors, we do have more than ever a diverse universe of donors that are transforming the philanthropic sector. That includes racial and ethnic diversity, um, 
different uh, sexual orientation being an important uh, factor, but increasingly uh, members of all different communities all playing a role in philanthropy. Um, as we look ahead, we will continue to see uh, diverse donors continue to shape the, shape the landscape. Uh, we often say that it is not no longer a one-size-fits-all universe. And for the Jewish um, network, Jewish funders network, the importance of um, paying attention to the role of women in driving philanthropy, their preferences, younger donors, and increasingly racial, ethnic diversity, and diversity within the LGBTQ community as well. This uh, pandemic uh, was also uh, perhaps um, brought, uh, for, for many people, exposed the deep racial and um, social justice uh, issues that COVID did not cause them, but only expose them. So in this period, we've had greater awareness of racial inequality. And we've also seen philanthropy meet this moment with a great deal of announcements by corporations, by foundations, but also individual donors who recommitted to giving to uh, racial equity causes and also social justice. Uh, we've seen this uh, from uh, many Jewish funders, but also in a broader sense with many corporations, especially um, emphasizing their commitment to racial equity and following that up with donations and other uh, policy changes. As we look ahead, the first three findings sort of talk about what is, uh, I'd like to sort of shift gears and talk about what's next. And the question that is on our minds as we track this data is, are we at an inflection point in philanthropy? And to answer that question, we have done quite a bit of analysis on uh, what the giving landscape looks like now and what that means for the future. As we look at the large gift announcements, this data is tracked by Candid, so we're updating this as we go. Corporate donors have accounted for about half of all the funding announcements that have been made. In addition to the corporate donors, we've also seen community foundations and independent foundations play a big role. Just to give you another data point, uh, COVID relief funds have been set up in nearly every community in the United States. Uh, we've tracked about a billion dollars within those COVID funds, and of those billion dollars, close to $680 million has already been committed. In terms of how the dollars have been allocated, once again, corporations have been at the forefront of the dollars, not just the uh, funding announcements, with uh, independent foundations and also community foundations playing a leading role as well. The final point as we start to look ahead is the role of technology. Prior to the pandemic, we saw that many more donors were giving uh, through mobile means, through the internet, and also through crowdfunding. In some ways, COVID has accelerated those trends. And just to give you a sense of how uh, this is taking place, prior to the pandemic, online giving made up less than 10% of overall giving, but it was growing at double digit rates, about 12% year over year in the last few years. We expect that this, this uh, trend will only be accelerated as more people are working remotely, more events are held virtually, and conferences and other types of relationships are being developed. I think a big question for many um, nonprofit organizations and many that uh, the funders in this audience will fund is to what extent those uh, um, organizations can build relationships, uh, deepen relationships and ultimately build trust with donors and engage donors through these online methods. Finally, uh, along this line of technology, one big um, breakthrough trend perhaps in the pandemic is the role of crowdfunding. The idea of personalized approaches to raise funds. We certainly saw that in the wake of the hurricanes in 2017 and 2018. We're seeing this at an even greater scale. One very quick example is the CDC Foundation has raised more than $50 million on a platform called charity.com. We're seeing 
crowdfunding emerge as a storytelling um, platform where many donors are telling their stories and sharing their stories through GoFundMe and through so many other means. Another data point, just to mention very quickly, the crowdfunding campaign for George Floyd uh, was one of the largest in the platform's history in terms of the dollars raised, as well as the number of donors, many of them very small donors from all over the world. To end the discussion, I want us to go back to Arundhati Roy's uh, notion that pandemics in the past have uh, allowed humans to imagine a future that's different. And for all of us, the pandemic allows us to think anew about our work and recommit to some of the things that we have always uh, held uh, to be core values, but also be inspired to be courageous and, and do things in a bold and meaningful way. I want to say that as we look ahead, well, one of the things we have seen is uh, the role of technology play uh, an important role. Women and girls uh, also emerging as an important area even in this pandemic, but also the expansion of a toolkit with impact investing, measuring impact, and many other new forms of giving taking center stage. As I close today, uh, we started by thinking about philanthropometrics, the idea of philanthropy, love of mankind, alongside the notion of measurement. Uh, all of us are going to be called and continue to be called to act at these unprecedented times. Um, many of us serve as leaders in our organization, and this moment calls for transformational leadership uh, with many boards and board members actually serving as change agents. In terms of the role of philanthropy, uh, we've been able to look back a hundred years and look at what role philanthropy played in previous pandemics. And just uh, a, a few quick thoughts to leave you with. We have seen organizations already and in the past play the role of addressing gaps, innovate like never before and collaborate as a partner with government and the private sector. And one unique role for philanthropic organizations and many of you in the audience today is to continue to lift up equity and inclusion concerns. So with that, I'd like to stop and turn it over to the panel. I know that I have only 10 minutes, but I'm sure we can come back to some of these points during the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Let me introduce this panel, uh, which the idea here is to bring down to earth, as it were, the 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 information that Una gave us. You know, Una talked at a general philanthropy level in 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 the U.S. and how that the, the philanthropic landscape is is changing or has changed during COVID. And the idea now is to say, okay, how is how are these trends that Una spoke about manifesting themselves in the Jewish community. What are we observing kind of at the ground level um, in the Jewish community and in the world of Jewish philanthropy? So I wanted to start by asking you, know, you Rachel and, and Alex, what, what have you learned? Uh, what have you observed in, in terms of, of learning points for the future of in these first nine months of nine already, 10, whatever, <laughs> a lot, a uh, month of the of the pandemic. Rachel, you're gonna go? Sure. Um, first, uh, a thank you to Elizabeth, who just helped me figure out my camera and mic about two minutes ago. So I'm uh, grateful that I'm joining. I, so apropos I learning, been, we're all learning so yes, how to deal with learning. this. It's like, you know, it, it works, technology. Um, I think this has been a time so much about learning about who and what is essential and also about the importance of care and i think we know that you know we've been going through this we're having a conversation around the sector of philanthropy but we've also been going through this as human beings and i think that there's something about the lessons that we're learning in this time that both translates to our lives and to our work and so for us and the work we were doing it really was a very quick, you know, while our whole team was adjusting to the privilege of getting to work out of our house and not having to to um, be on the front line, 
really thinking about what, what was philanthropy's role in this moment and how to, could we do things really differently? And so I think, I think among the things we learned was we could move faster than we ever had. We let it freed so much was liberated. We freed up a lot of the systems and the processes that we had in place. Um, you know, suddenly we didn't need the long reports. Suddenly we could just do wiring of money. We didn't need a formal board meeting. We didn't need to wait till, you know, our board was gonna meet whatever month or day. Um, people were available in a different way. We found that we added zeros to our giving, that the amounts that we thought we were constrained by, maybe we aren't. Um, and also this notion of, you know, we've talked a lot about partnership and relationship, but what does it actually mean to be in relationship with people when there's so much, um, uh, you know, somebody said, a uh, poet we spoke to said, this is a moment of being awake and awake. There's a grief element to it and there's an awakening element. So how do you, how do you work with people when there's grief happening? Um, and so we checked in differently to the people that we work alongside in the field. Um, we called them in advance and said, you don't have to, you don't have to apply. We're, we're, we're moving our money out quickly. We're not waiting or we're giving more than we would otherwise, or in the space of racial equity, we're going to make a multi-year commitment because we know you're flush with money right now, but this is about what happens next year and the year after and the year after. So I think those kinds of practices, um, I hope will continue. Great. Um, Alex, uh, do you agree? Do you have other observations? What, what have we learned as a community in these nine months? Yeah, I think a lot of those things are very true for us as well. And I think one of the other pieces that I would like to highlight is um, how much was revealed about organizational health at this time. There are a lot of organizations in the field that were not operating with maybe best practices, whoever's defining those, but, you know, endowment building, uh, reserves, what does it look like to be able to weather a storm uh, and not have such a huge impact to everybody who puts their hearts into philanthropy. I always say like none of us are in philanthropy to get rich. Like we're all here because we care, because it deeply resonates with what we believe in. And so I know that this time for a lot of the executive directors and, and other folks who are, who are in decision-making positions to let go and lay off staff was utterly heartbreaking. And so looking how how do we adjust the field so that as these inevitable bumps come down the road, we have a little bit uh, more cushion. And what does that mean for, for philanthropists? How do we invest in the health of these organizations rather than just pushing for more and more programs, more this, more stretch, more reach? How do we look at what they what they actually need and then make those those gifts? That that I think it's it's a critical point, and maybe Una, you can you can bring some light on this from from the general community as well. I think that, you know, to your point, Alex, the, the it's like with COVID. You know, like if you have comorbidities, COVID will affect you much more. In other words, if if an organization wasn't very sustainable going into the crisis, uh, if somebody had health problems going into COVID, you know, it's 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 at more risk. And I think that one of the things that we can learn as a community is to eliminate those comorbidities, you know, so make make the system healthier as a whole. So then when a crisis hit, because it will, if it's not this, it's going to be something else, to be to be stronger to face it. Uh, so in, in that sense, in that sense, apropos crisis, you know, COVID for you guys in the West Coast um, hit after the fires and during the fires, how how did you manage to, or what can you share about prioritizing crisis and responses to crisis? Rachel, you want to take it? Sure. Um, you know, I, I have to admit that um, I generally have advised over the years not to be crisis funders. I really believe that we're playing the long game, that there's always going to be something so that when we're investing um, in organizations that are first responders. It's not just for what's happening in the moment, but really trying to think about that, but that most of our funding, like keep the eye on the ball of, you know, the long-term vision and where we want to go. Um, especially I think for um, 
you know, in, in working in, in private foundations, not individual donors who are, you know, responding to what's happening. This clearly is a, at a different scale. Um, and so we, again, you know, it felt like in, in the early days, the role of philanthropy was to get money out as quickly as possible until government could come in. And so it was a different level of responding to, to crisis. Um, I think we still try to have a little bit of a, a sense of criteria though. So it was not just, you know, any, but any funding, anything, but funding both for the short term, but also for partners that would build for the long term. So right. I'll give the example, um, you know, we, we, we funded World Central Kitchen um, at significant levels for their work. And partly it was looking at an organization that was gonna build local, local um, health beyond in terms of food. They were gonna be funding, um, they were employing local restaurants. So it was about keeping businesses open. It was connected to LAUSD and our commitments around education in Los Angeles. So it was like looking at if we're gonna if we're gonna fund in crisis, how do we fund well and for the longer term? And I think we asked that um, in you know in multiple crises. Yeah, Alex. I think one of the most obvious uh, examples for me is is around our local Jewish camping. Our our the camps being shut down created a, a huge economic challenge for these institutions. And at the same time, two or three, depending on how you count them, of our camps had burned down in the fires. And that was devastating to begin with and was going to create tons of challenges for rebuilding and the investment from the community and capital campaigns. And then on top of it, we were hit with all of these restrictions and the camps weren't able to operate this last summer. And we're looking at a summer where we're not even sure what the capacity will be for these camps to operate and with additional costs related to COVID uh, regulations. And so for us, and I know a lot of other donors in the community who really value camp, not only the individual camps that maybe pull on their, their family's hearts as uh, a movement in the Jewish community, uh, it was, it's been a very challenging discussion. How do we push these camps to continue to operate who don't even have a facility anymore? And then how do we fundraise to support what is, what is needed to be made up for during COVID or as, as a result of loss from COVID um, when some of these camps need to go to the same community to fundraise to rebuild their own, their own buildings, their own um, capital campaigns. And so that I don't have the answer to, but it has definitely been on our mind a lot. And I think ultimately where, where we landed was, okay, there's, there's the camps and the institutions and the organizations themselves. And then there are these families who rely on this. And if we lose touch with these kids who are getting some of them, their only Jewish content through this summer camp, which they love. And that's where, you know, Jewish education stops for them. If we lose them and they go to the private camps or they go to, you know, somewhere where they're focusing on water skiing instead of Shabbat, which is great. Um, how do we get them back? How do we keep those touch points? And so I think for us, it ended up being about the children and the future generations and making sure that those kids still had access to what, whatever was available. But uh, thinking about the community holistically who that's dealing with these two challenges, it's really hard. Yeah. It's just hard. There's no way around it. C certainly is. Una, do you, do you have any tips of how general funders go about prioritizing in times of simultaneous crises? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I think many funders, uh, this is something that they have never dealt with before. Um, I think the, the advice or the lessons we've learned from this crisis, but also other crises is uh, funders all have to determine what their core values are, both uh, in good times and bad times. And those are the sort of North Star that can help them uh, navigate those. So as an example, uh, during the 2017, 2018, hurricanes and disasters, we saw that many funders actually started to establish a disaster, um, what would you call it, budget and profile so that when those crises came up, they could respond to them. So one big message I think for all funders who are joining us today is 
we are starting to think that disasters are here to stay. And those might be small scale crises, um, local crises, or larger ones. And being able to respond to them is part of what philanthropy does best. We're also learning that the philanthropic sector can play not just that short term role in terms of responding to the crisis, but helping communities with the rebuilding and recovery stages. And so in addition to setting aside funds for those types of uh, short term responses, thinking about how to stay with certain communities and issues, even through the recovery phase and the rebuilding. So that's probably the big lesson for us from the big picture. That, that's, that, that, that's great. Yeah, sorry. Rachel, sorry, I'm sorry ahead. to just, but just to respond to, you know, what, what you were, you, you made me think about something, which is in terms of, so what's the role for the longer term in these crises? And part of it is, I think we have the luxury if we're not in, in the, really in the front line, to be able to look ahead just a little bit to see what's around the corner um, and to and to develop systems and to look to see where maybe others aren't. So for us, one of, one of the things we started asking ourselves was about issues of spiritual care, which we've been investing in places like the Institute for Jewish Spirituality for years and thinking about clergy and moral leadership. How do you support them? Um, we started thinking about you know, larger systems around education and learning and what's gonna happen with learning loss both in terms of Jewish learning, both in terms of general learning, and how do we start again thinking for not what's happening next week or next month, but what's gonna happen in a year or two or three. And I think and more that, that that's one of the roles also um, for philanthropy. Sorry, yeah. Andres, and, and I, to interrupt. And I would add, no, 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 that's totally, that, that's great. And I, I would add also that, you know, we something that I'm seeing from, from my perch at the JFN is that, you know, there is a growing role, I think, for funders that federations and different umbrella bodies play because they can be an excellent resource for funders to help them prioritize the different resources. Like a federation has somehow an overall view of the community and can help direct traffic. I mean, some of the foundations can do their work on their own, but some others can't. And it's, 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 it's really important, I think, to to bring the role of federations here to the forefront as people that can help direct traffic and keep the view of the community and at the national level the same, you know, JFNA and JCCEA. And, you know, I think that one of the things that I'm learning from this crisis is the, the value of partnership between communal structures and, and, um, and private funders. And going to that, and one of the, you know, knowing that we are talking to people in Los Angeles, I got to ask a question. Is this crisis, do you think, is it a blip or an earthquake? And you guys have experience in earthquakes. So uh, what, what, you know, do you think we're going back to quote unquote normal or is this something like my friend Jay Sanderson calls it a tsunami or or something that really changes or should change the structure of the Jewish community as a, as a whole. Rachel, want to go first? Sure. I, I guess I would say yes and yes. I mean, if we're going to use the earthquake as an example, <laughs> it's that, you know, we all go back to life as usual, but the fault lines are still there. And, um, and so I think that that's in some ways, I, I, I think the, you know, the there will be certain changes in, in different um, sectors that that are going to be fundamental shifts. Um, I think human behavior, you know, there will be changes in, in how people behave. But I also think it's a choice. And the question is, for something so terrible, are we going to use this as an opportunity? Um, are we going to stay awake? Are we going to um, continue to, you know, shift how we relate to the field? Are we going to... Um, you know, ensure that we remember that those, you know, deep rooted issues are still there and need to be attended to. So I, I hope the answer will be yes for that, but I do think it's a choice. Hmm. Great, Alex, any thoughts on this? Bleep, tsunami, earthquake. Um, uh, I, I agree with the, the earthquake reference that I think that um, even though this this might this has the potential to shake things up quite a bit, it's not going to be the only 
event in our future, right? We're expecting more disasters, which is a really sad place to be in. But I guess our new reality with the way that the, the earth has been changing. Um, I, I, I think that humans are incredibly resilient and also tend toward comfort and really want things to feel comfortable. And I believe that this has been a deeply uncomfortable place for all of us in, on so many different levels. And so while I, I hope that people, especially those of us who are in these incredibly privileged positions of philanthropy to, to make differences in our communities that otherwise wouldn't be made, I, I'm, I'm um, cautiously hopeful, I would say, that we stay that we stay alert to what's necessary to be done to really create change for a lot an ongoing future a long a long lasting change so, and, and um, i'm gonna ask you una as well but I, but i want to say uh, for me i think that one of the things when i talk about earthquake um is the opportunity of rebuild the community system as a whole under different foundations you know, better collaboration, better, more systemic view, more, as you say, reducing comorbidities. We're talking about camps, Alex, before, like, are the camps sustainable to start with? You know, and this, this, this also brings me back to conversation I had with the federations about this, about do we look at the entire camping system in a city and see what was so? Una, do you, do you think funders in the general, in the, in the secular society are treating this as a as, as, as an opportunity to rethink the entire system or they're trying to sort of shore up institution and bring, and bring things back to normal? Yes, I think we are seeing that uh, quite a few funders are rethinking the whole uh, structure of philanthropy. In addition to COVID, we've also had the racial and social justice movements. Right. And I think the combination of factors is the phrase that we all hear a lot, which is build back better. And in many funding communities, I think that has been the phrase, how can we build back better and build back in a way that uh, helps us solve some of these systemic problems. Uh, one big lesson I think we can also take from past events like this is that funders can be part of creating that new world. They don't have to just respond, they can actually be part of the solution. And so when we say build back better, I think um, the philanthropic community has a seat at the table. The Jewish uh, funding community also has a, not just a seat at the table, but a chance to build that table right. and make sure that it's inclusive and that we bring all the, all the relevant voices uh, forward. Yeah, and I, I, if I can, if I can, you know, if, if if I can put my plug here, I think that for me, this rethinking of the system is probably one of the most important things we need to do and we need to do them together. And hopefully the relations we build with uh, each other, with communal organizations, with federations, with you know national bodies should be the platform, that, that table that you're talking to, um, you know, to, to rethink systems and, and build back better. Now, talking about going back and not going back, uh, uh, many many funders have you know st started to fund in new in new areas, right? Like so, uh, one of the big funders in Jewish identity just made a huge grant on Jewish poverty, you know, because of the needs. And 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 Rachel, you mentioned you know new grants. And do you, do you think that in your own experience, in your own foundation, and also in the things you're seeing in the general community, do you think that folks are staying with those new fields or are they going to go back to their original focus area or something what what's your take on that do you want me to start yes um i you know i think i i work with with multiple funders and foundations so yeah. i think it you know it depends it's it depends on the individual i think for some and also how people respond to crisis i think for some this has been a um, clarion call that the long game and issues of you know systemic the systemic roots of what's happening need to be addressed in big ways and that that is something that you need to stick with. I think for some others we've worked with, it's been about like deepening relationships and getting even more um, 
closely aligned with people in the field, but not not wanting to go big, like really wanting to go deep, making sure, Alex, as you were talking about, that the financial health of the institutions and the efforts that they've cared about, that they need to shore up even more. Um, so I think it really depends. I, again, I think to to do, you know, this work well, it's it's the work of a lifetime. And so I, I would hope that, um, you know, that there are certain issues that, you know, some are quick fixes, but most are not, that people have the, um, the wherewithal and the patience to be able to, to stick with it. And people are human and, um, you know, uh, you know, other things, other things get in, in the way sometimes. Alex, what are you saying? Or what are you predicting? People will stay with these new areas or? I have seen a lot of incredible work being done to respond to what, what's been going on, both as a result of COVID and the racial and social justice movements. Um, I Most of what I have seen has been framed as like emergency relief. Right. Um, and that's okay as long as there's a mentality that if the emergency continues, that that relief continues as well. I personally have been feeling a little bit more along the lines of what Rachel was talking about in deepening relationships. We've made some investments in organizations here in Los Angeles over the years, and some of our one of some of my instincts were to um, reach out to them immediately. And when COVID started and to ask them what they needed, what the situation was looking like and how we could help. And then to get those grants out the door as quickly as possible. Um, and, and that in part is because I believe in the work that we've been doing. And so that belief in that work doesn't go away during an emergency, but also because they're investments that we have made. And I don't mean this in like a heartless term, but like these are organizations that we have been working right. with for years and to throw away our investments because of um, this earthquake seemed silly. It seemed like a, a waste of all of our previous efforts. So going deeper was definitely where my heart landed, but I'm super grateful to those who have taken on new avenues and new fields and are now finding that those are the investments that they want to protect so, long-term. So it's a balance in a way, right? Between the, between the, the, the keeping, you know, not not disinvesting what you've been investing in and, and then keep your eyes open. You know, some of the things for me are like, you know, people that, you know, once you see something, you can't unsee them. For, for example, for, for me, you know, I saw many funders, once they saw the extent of Jewish poverty, and not just because of COVID, they got into it because of COVID, but then they saw the extent of Jewish poverty. You can't unsee that and you feel you have to do something. On the other hand, you're right, if we all flock you know, and in in a pack to the to the to the new crisis. So, who builds the long the long thing? And I think one of the elements that 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 you were both saying about getting grants faster out of the door. And I think I think that these practices remain. That that's good yeah. funding. And I don't know if you and I, yeah. Una, you probably agree with this. That's good good philanthropic practice, right? Like cut you know red tape, less bureaucracy, more you know flexible support. I hope that doesn't go back to normal and stays like that are you are you seeing una movement towards faster and more efficient and and and, and more empathetic grant making absolutely that was actually one thing that resonated with me uh from rachel and alex's uh, comments this idea that philanthropy can be nimble and flexible and agile and move towards more collaborative funding models where funders are actually asking their grantees, how can we support you to deepen your work or to achieve greater impact or to respond to the needs? And I think those models, because they are very effective, our research already shows that uh, many funders are seeing that they can get actually their work done in these more efficient ways by uh, reducing some of that red tape. And the collaborative approach uh, can also lead to, um, I would say, optimal outcomes for the funder and the communities that they're trying to serve, especially some of the uh, organizations that are right in the front lines of the pandemic here. Those organizations certainly know their work much better than the funders do. 
Um, and so I think these practices are really, uh, have been shown to be effective already, but have been time tested now in the pandemic and hopefully will continue into the future. Excellent. We, we, we need to start, yeah, sorry, Alex, go ahead. I would also add what, what we have, what I have seen, and I'm sure you have seen as well, is that a lot of funders have been coordinating better during this time in a way that, especially in the Jewish community in America, uh, that we is almost unprecedented. Like there has been communication between funders across the board. And we, you know, we're here we are in the West Conference, like we've seen more communication by Coastal has been fantastic for, for us here on the West Coast. And I'm really praying that that funder coordination stays alive forever. <laughs> yes, 100%. Funder, as I was saying before, funder coordination among funders and then funder coordination with other communal bodies, which is which makes us much more stronger. We have we have to start wrapping up. Uh, we have a couple of questions from the from the audience. Um, one was, and maybe I can rub them all up, and then uh, we can we can answer them uh, uh, together. There is a question about the climate crisis as sort of under undergirding many of the things that are happening, and and sort of is there other systemic crises that impact all the work we do? I guess that's that's the way I would read that that question. And then there's something about the aspect of human capital here of how leadership and, and, and professional know-how plays in. I mean, Rachel, you kind of mentioned it a little bit about, you know, the, the, the mental health of the, um, of, of, the, of the human resource in the community. So any, any word you want to add to that? Alex, you want to start this time? So the question is, what are other uh, movements that are affecting us yeah. systemically? Yeah. Um, well, we touched on it a bit. The racial and social justice movements, I think, are really important to touch on uh, or to emphasize. Uh, I think also the economic disparity that exists in our communities, that's tied to social inequities, but it's um, really important also to raise up as something that uh, philanthropy un undoubtedly plays a role in because whenever we're doing relief work or support work or pro bono law, law work or whatever it might be, like that we're providing that work because our systems are so broken that we have this huge level of disparity. Um, those are that's what comes to mind first, Rachel. Do you have something else that comes to mind? I mean, health, access to clean to good food, health. I mean, it's all. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to go there, but it's Rachel, all a little bit broken. Rachel, you want to touch on the human capital issue? Yeah, I guess I would say, I mean, there's something about the fact that we're all seeing each other in our homes and, um, you know, with kids going by and, and pets and, and also people alone. And I think that it, if we ever understood that there are human beings behind this work, that work happens by people, um, especially now. And so I think, you know, at the end, there are so many feelings of this year, but the feeling of gratitude, I think, is so strong for people doing this work. And so it's very different when um, you're having a conversation about funding and, um, you know, you're, you're in somebody's house. And so I think that, I think this sense of human beings, of what it's taken for people to have to lead in a moment when they themselves are disoriented and when there's like another, you know, wave or crisis coming, and also not knowing what's not, what, not knowing what's going to come. So as I, I think I said the word care early on, and I think there's something about tenderness too, um, a word we generally don't use in you know philanthropy and social change. But um, I think I, I hope that that's something. Um, I hope that's something that stays. Beautiful, Una. What gives you hope from this crisis, from what you're seeing? I think it's the speed of innovation the um, agility that we've seen in the philanthropic sector, the resilience, but it's also this culture of collaboration that a few people touched on, whether it's at the global level or in local communities, seeing people really work together um, has been inspiring. And I do think the leaders of organizations, including uh, many in the Jewish community have been inspiring to watch. Many have led their organizations, their work, but also uh, served as inspiring voices within communities. There's so many that we can point to in our own local community here. Uh, and so I, I guess I would um, 
sort of uh, use this opportunity to thank all of you who are on the front lines of this work and uh, ask you to continue to be the voices of inspiration and hope. And, and we definitely need, uh, need our leaders to, to be those uh, during these moments. Amen to that. And with that, I think it's a it's a great it's a great place to 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 close. Those of you that have questions, please shoot us an email to Tivia, to me, to David, and, and we'll try to we'll try to circulate them to the to the to the presenters and and uh, answer them offline. Unfortunately, we have to wrap up. But uh, enjoy the rest of the day. As as I said at the at the beginning, let's use this time to to keep on doing the work we're doing and Thank learn you. more about how we can do it better. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to our amazing panel and to our moderator, JFN CEO, Andres Vicoini. We all have a lot to digest at our own grant-making committees or family tables. We so appreciate this thoughtful conversation.